violence, hate, bigotry, the images that haunt any Ulster Prime Minister, the images that have finally driven Major Chichester Clark from office. As governments come, go and reshuffle, Ulster continues its ancient feuds and relives battles of long ago. When a new Prime Minister is appointed tomorrow, he will inherit 400 years of bloody history. Ulster today is as it was in the beginning. The day has come, I feel, when we should speak out. We should say what we mean, and we should mean what we say. I say this. Even Adolf Hitler hadn't the powers that they have cast today. All I can say is no popery. Are we going to be like the Jews? Are we going to sit down and watch all this happening? I am not on a quest for truth, for I have found the truth. you be free from your burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood oh. father forgive them for they know not what they do during the last few weeks, this city of ours has been torn by strife and trouble. And if you go on rejecting Christ, if you go on refusing my Savior, You'll die in your sins and go to hell forevermore. And we are breeding because of the apathy and the lying and the deceit of the government at Stormont. We are breeding a monster in our midst which someday will be uncontrollable. Ulster's monster has many names. To extreme Protestants, it is the Catholic minority, defiantly loyal to the Pope in Rome and the Republic in Dublin, rather than to the British Crown. To Catholics, the monster is Protestant supremacy, a system they claim makes them second-class citizens in their own country. And to millions watching the ritual bloodletting on television, the monster is Ulster itself, its drums and guns, its priests, parsons and politicians. Not all Ulster Protestants are fanatics. Not all Ulster Catholics are moderates. Only a minority believe in violence, but it's the extremists on both sides who have been making the running through Ulster's troubled history. Tonight, using archive film and extracts from seven World in Action programmes made in Northern Ireland, World in Action looks back at four centuries of bloodshed in Ulster. Today's headlines tell yesterday's stories. 1603, England completes its conquest of Ireland by subduing Ulster. 1607, Ulster's Catholics driven off their land by Protestant settlers. 1690, Protestant William of Orange defeats Catholic King James at the Battle of the Boyne. The 1790s, a series of Irish rebellions smashed by British troops and Protestant settlers. The 1830s, first street rioting in Belfast between Protestant Shankill Road and Catholic Falls Road. 1920, the IRA and the Black and Tans fight for control of Ireland. 1921, Ireland divided, Ulster stays British. 1969, Ulster on the brink of civil war, 500 people burnt out of their homes. 1971, Belfast buries its dead, as it was in the beginning. History's signposts. But the story began a thousand years ago. Ireland was an outpost of Christian civilization when Europe was lost in the Dark Ages. But in the 12th century, the Normans came from England. 
they came for land. Ireland became England's first colony. At first, conqueror and conquered shared the same religion, but when England went Protestant under Henry VIII, Ireland stubbornly stuck to her own ways. The peasants of the northern province, Ulster, were stubbornest of all. They stayed obstinately Gaelic and defiantly Catholic. The Reformation plunged the whole of Europe into bitter religious war. England struggled to maintain a Protestant throne. Ireland, a potential ally of Catholic enemies on the continent, had to be dealt with. Ulster's defiant rebellion had to be broken. Ulster fell to Queen Elizabeth. A new Lord Lieutenant was appointed, Sir Arthur Chichester, whose descendants have been prominent in Ulster life ever since. Chichester's mission was to secure Protestant supremacy for all time. Since the native Catholics wouldn't be converted, they had to be replaced. Thousands of staunch Protestants from England and Scotland were shipped over to colonise Ulster. Catholics were driven off their land, which was parcelled out in thousand-acre lots for Protestant settlers. The Ulster problem had begun. The Protestant newcomers protected themselves by building walled, fortified cities. Protestants lived inside and kept the Catholics outside. The time has scarce gone round, boys, two hundred years ago. When rebels on old Derry's walls, their faces dare not show. When James and all his rebel band came up to the bishop's gate, with heart and hand and sword and shield, we caused him to retreat. The walls of Londonderry helped the Protestants resist a three-month siege by the Catholic armies of James II and on the 12th of July 1690, James was defeated by Protestant William of Orange at the Battle of the Boyne. Protestant supremacy now seemed permanently secured. Then fight and don't surrender, but come when duty calls. With heart and hand and sword and shield, we'll guard old Gary's walls. Catholics were now forbidden public worship, debarred from the Irish Parliament, refused commissions in the services, refused the right to buy land, and forbidden to possess weapons. This was the age of the penal laws. Resistance movements were common and often savage. Protestant peasants and gentry fought back. Just as the Ku Klux Klan in America mixed ritual, religion and terrorism to resist Negro emancipation, so Protestant secret societies fought Catholic emancipation in the 19th century. The most influential and lasting of these societies was the Orange Order. Today, despite its parades and ritual burnings of rebels and traitors, the Order insists that it is inoffensive and moderate. But moderation wasn't its most prominent quality in 1795 when its founders toasted its hero, William of Orange. To the glorious, pious and immortal mummery of King William III, who saved us from rogues and roguery, slaves and slavery, knaves and knavery, popes and popery from brass money and wooden shoes. And whoever denies this toast, may he be slammed, crammed and jammed into the muzzle of the great gun of Athlone, and the gun fired into the pope's bully, and the pope into the devil's bully, and the devil into hell, and the door locked and the key in an orange man's pocket. The Orange Men helped the British divide and rule. They forged an alliance between Protestant peasants and landlords against the native Irish. While Orange Protestants and Irish Catholics fought their ritual battles, the Protestant gentry got on with the business of ruling. On July the 12th every year, the Orange Men paraded to celebrate their victory at the Boyne and humiliate Catholics with reminders of their defeat. Riots followed so regularly and predictably that Parliament in 1824 considered banning all religious parades in Ireland, but decided instead to leave them to die a natural death. For a time, Belfast escaped all this. Catholics and Presbyterians actually joined forces, and the first Irish Republican movement was founded by Protestants. But as Belfast grew, the Protestant and Catholic battle lines of the country invaded the city. By the 1820s, working-class Belfast was rigidly segregated and rioting was commonplace for the next 50 years. In 1886, Gladstone made his first attempt to give Ireland home rule. 
but Ulster Protestants fought back. They found a champion in independent Tory MP Lord Randolph Churchill. I decided some time ago that if Gladstone went for home rule, the orange card would be the one to play. Please God, it may turn out the ace of trumps. Orangemen and aristocratic conservatives united in the Unionist Party. For 30 years they obstructed Irish home rule, especially in Ulster. A Protestant lawyer, Sir Edward Carson, organised the UVF, the Ulster Volunteer Force, and armed it with 37,000 guns and 3 million rounds of ammunition bought from Germany. The UVF and Ulster Unionists prepared for a last-ditch defence of Protestant supremacy. In the south, the Irish Volunteers, a Catholic Republican group, made their own preparations. They too bought arms from Germany. Labour leader James Connolly organised an armed workers' militia, the Citizens' Army. At Easter 1916, while England was distracted by war with Germany, the Irish rebels struck. They seized Dublin, drove out its British administrators and proclaimed an independent Irish Republic. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she received her old traditions of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. The rising lasted less than a week, but 400 British troops died. Heavy guns bombarded rebel positions and entire squads of rebels were wiped out. The leaders of the rising were arrested and in twos and threes they were sent before the firing squad. Fifteen were shot without trial. Another martyr for old Ireland, another martyr for the crown, whose brutal laws may kill the Irish, but can't keep their spirit down. The execution stirred Irish nationalism to a new intensity. At the 1918 election, Sinn Féin, militant home rulers, won a landslide victory everywhere except Ulster. Ulster's opposition to any break with England persuaded Lloyd George to delay home rule yet again. But the southern rebels did a UDI. They set up their own parliament in Dublin and recruited their own guerrilla force, the Irish Republican Army. England sent in its own special force, half army khaki, half police black, the black and tanned. 1916, the forces For Lloyd George, the jig was up. He conferred with the King. In a desperate attempt to solve the insoluble, Britain proposed a compromise, partition. Southern Ireland won home rule. Ulster, though given its own regional parliament, stayed part of the United Kingdom. In June 1921, King George V came to Belfast to open the new Northern Ireland Parliament, Stormont. Fifty years of unbroken Protestant Unionist government lay ahead. But at first, the Catholic parties boycotted Stormont. They refused to recognize the border. Ireland divided, never shall be free. Ireland divided, calls to you and me. For her to sake, abandon all your fears. Ireland is calling, calling for volunteers. Partition isolated the Catholic minority in the north. In the Catholic ghettos of Belfast, almost unchanged today after 50 years, they felt betrayed. Many refuse to accept partition. Many still refuse today. For them, the War of Independence isn't yet over. The IRA isn't yet redundant. Ireland united, every night I pray. Ireland united, free from Saxon sway. The time is near when our flag from shore to shore shall wave over free men, republic forevermore. That's right. Come on, 
50 years after partition, the IRA is active both north and south of the border, though illegal in both countries and condemned by the church hierarchy. World in Action filmed this secret training session in the summer of 1969. Ulster has other leftovers from partition. The Ulster Volunteer Force, Protestant extremist equivalent of the IRA, trusts God and keeps its powder dry. World in Action filmed this practice alert on the hills near Belfast in the autumn of 1969. Militant Protestant feeling is strongest on Belfast's Shankill Road. Like the falls, the Shankill hasn't changed much in 50 years. Here, here, the 12th is here. Let's go up the Shankill, let's go up the Shankill. Here, here, the 12th is here. Let's go up the Shankill Road. For it's a grand old place to come from. And it's a fine old place to stay. Loyalists in every street who are not ashamed to fly the flag they stand for. We don't care for what the Fenians say. We don't give a damn. When the twelfth day comes, you will find King Billy's sons on the shank hill behind an orange band. The Queen of England is also the Queen of Northern Ireland and we support the Crown, we support the Queen. We as Protestants have always been Protestants and British and we intend to remain and stay British. After partition, the Queen's men of the Shankill and the Pope's men of the Falls were the noisiest factions in Ulster. The border remained the dominant issue in Ulster's politics. But in 1968, there was a sudden change. The winds of protest blowing through Europe and America blew into Ulster. It started with peaceful protests like this one in Derry. A new civil rights movement opened its campaign on immediate issues, housing, unemployment, local government reforms. World in Action documented its progress. Civil rights broke with the old traditions of Ulster in three ways. It ignored religion, it abandoned violence, it ignored the border. Its first aim was an end to local election fiddling with the introduction of a British-style one-man, one-vote system. We want exactly the same rights as the people of Birmingham or the people of Coventry or the people of Doncaster. One man, one vote, and we won't be satisfied until such times as we get it. We have a situation where one man in this town has 26 votes in a local government election. I'm a 25-year-old worker. I don't have a single vote. I resent that, and I intend to demonstrate against it. The civil rights movement may have been non-violent in intention, but from its inception it aroused violent reactions. Inevitably, most of its supporters were Catholics, so the movement provoked Protestant hostility. On October the 5th, 1968, the Ulster police broke up a civil rights demonstration on the orders of the right-wing Minister for Home Affairs, William Craig, who condemned civil rights as an IRA front. Evidence of IRA control was thin, but civil rights did have its revolutionary wing, people's democracy. One of its leaders, a left-wing student called Bernadette Devlin, captured a unionist stronghold in a Westminster parliamentary by-election. People's democracy and civil rights were on the map. So was the record of growing violence. Londonderry, 54 injured in clashes with police. Belfast, a march to Londonderry ambushed 103 casualties. Dungannon, two serious clashes, shots fired. Armagh, 14 injured, Ian Paisley arrested and imprisoned. Newry, riots reach a climax at civil rights march. Violence at Newry in January 1969 appeared to discredit the civil rights movement. World in Action had four cameras there. The film record showed that the violence was started by hostile crowds waiting for the march to pass. The Ulster government put the blame on the marchers. Violence became more frequent. And there was much worse to come. The troubles reached their height in August 1969. A riot followed an orange parade on the walls of Derry. Armed police invaded the Catholic bogside and were pelted with petrol bombs from the roof of a block of flats. A three-day battle followed. The riots spread to Belfast. 
On the night of August the 15th, 518 Catholics were burnt out of their homes. The Catholic ghettos barricaded themselves against police and Protestants. Ulster seemed headed for a new civil war. But the British government decided to intervene. Troops were flown in to keep the peace. They were welcomed by Protestants because they were British and by Catholics because they replaced the police. Now the British troops were keeping order, the British government could call the tune. To end the injustices that had sparked off the riots, Westminster pressed the Unionist government in Belfast to commit itself to sweeping reforms in housing, local government and police methods. To hardline Protestants, the reform programme was a betrayal, a sellout to Ulster's enemies. An army in our midst that has been briefed, and I have seen the briefing that the army have got, and they have been briefed to look on the Protestant population as the troublemakers at this present time. Especially the Orange Institution and the Ulster Special Constabulary that was, and the Free Presbyterian Church. Don't forget the Paisleyites. Yes. Ian Paisley ran for Parliament and won seats in both the Northern Ireland and Westminster Houses of Commons. But there was no going back on the reform programme. The Westminster government saw to that. The hard-pressed Unionists proceeded to disarm the police, disband the ultra-Protestant Special Constabulary, reform the housing system and concede the civil rights demand for one man, one vote. Even Paisley's explosive entry into politics couldn't stop the reforms. But to Catholic Republicans, the reforms were too little and too late. They didn't trust the Unionists. They didn't trust the new Conservative government in Westminster. They didn't trust the British Army. They returned to their old slogan, Sinn Féin, ourselves alone. The IRA took on a new lease of life. More people bought arms. In February 1971, the British Army began a house-to-house -house search for illegal weapons in Catholic areas. There was more rioting. Twelve people died. But Protestants said the troops were not being tough enough in rooting out Catholic troublemakers. They demanded all-out war on the IRA and a new Prime Minister to lead them into battle. The loser, Ulster. Investment is falling. Industrialists don't like petrol bombs. Tourism is down, holidaymakers don't like riots. Unemployment is twice as high as in the rest of Britain. Britain pours more than £100 million a year into Ulster's tottering economy. More and more people ask why and for how long. But Ulster isn't all one big riot. While reporters and film units record the bloody troubles in the towns, life goes on peacefully enough in the country. Violence in the mountains of Morn is child's play. There are thousands of staunch Protestants and pious Catholics who have never hurled a petrol bomb for Christ's sake. Peace is what they're all after, an end to 400 years of the troubles. To Protestant Unionists, peace will come when the IRA is disarmed and defeated. To Catholics, peace will come when the Unionists end their ties with the Orange Order and abandon the doctrine of Protestant supremacy. 
to Catholic Republicans, peace will come when the border goes. To Ulster's revolutionaries, peace will come when both the Belfast and Dublin governments are swept away and replaced by a united Irish Socialist Republic. To reconcile the irreconcilable, that is the job of Ulster's new Prime Minister, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, rest and abide with us today and tomorrow until the day break and the shadows all flee away for Jesus' sake. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.